So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and it was discovered in 2012 by Jennifer Downer and Emmanuel Charpentier. They were actually awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. So what is CRISPR? CRISPR is a system that is used to edit genes by cutting off the ends. And to understand how it works, we must first take a look at the bacterial defense system. So when a bacteria is infected by a virus, the small repeats of the virus are found inside the DNA of the bacteria. These repeats are used to identify that the bacteria is actually infected. Cas9 is an enzyme which cuts DNA. The bacteria uses Cas9 to then cut the genetic harmful genetic code of the virus. So then how can Cas9 be used inside animal cells so that we can use it in the context of editing human genes? So RNA is a molecule that can read genetic information and it acts as a guide to take Cas9 to the precise spot in the DNA where the gene needs to be edited. Cas9 then locks onto the double-stranded DNA and unzips it. Guide RNA pairs up with the targeted region and then Cas9 snips both strands of the DNA at the correct location. The cell senses this issue and repairs the problem then. So how can this process be used to actually edit genes? So when the cell senses the problem and repairs that break, this actually disables the gene, which can be helpful in disabling genes that play a role in inherited diseases. You can, scientists can also create gene mutations to compare cells with and without the mutation and find out the roles of proteins. They can also edit single nucleotide bases and they can also tag spots in the DNA with fluorescent protein tags. So in 2015, scientists at Harvard and MIT actually discovered a newer, a newer system that could be used with CRISPR, and that is CPF1. There are a few yet admirable differences between the two. So Cas9 forms a complex with two RNA molecules, but CPF1 forms a complex with only one RNA molecule. And added to its already smaller size, this makes CPF1 easier to deliver to cells and tissues. Cas9 also cuts both DNA strands at the same time, leaving blunt ends, which can often undergo mutations. And although there has been some research done in finger-like projections, which can push away the proteins to ensure that the wrong gene is not cut, um, CPF, CPF1 provides a more efficient way because it actually leaves two short overhangs on the exposed ends. And this helps with the precise insertion and integration of DNA by scientists. CPF1 also cuts further away from the recognition site, so if the gene does become mutated, it can always just be recut. Um, lastly, Cas9 first attaches to a small short sequence called PAM, and targets are chosen that are naturally occurring adjacent to PAM. But CPF1 actually recognizes a different variety of PAM sequences, so therefore they can edit a different variety of genes. So there are many applications of CRISPR which provide benefits to society. Firstly being that you can genetically modify plants and animals to increase crop yield, mass, remove diseases, etc. They can also treat and prevent long-term and short-term diseases such as Huntington's, HIV, cystic fibrosis, etc. And they can also be used to edit cells in cancer therapy. However, there's still a lot of research being done into the difficulties that would be faced at a clinical level. There are currently many trials underway uh, for lots of diseases that are related to blood, eyes, inflammation, protein folding, etc. But today I'll be talking in a little bit more detail about sickle cell disease. So for some background information, sickle cell disease, um, red blood cells, are actually, they actually transport oxygen around the body for cell respiration to produce energy for life. In sickle cell disease, the sickle shape of the red blood cells blocks blood vessels, which can prevent and stop blood flow. There are some treatments, but they have severe side effects and also result in frequent blood transfusions. Um, using CRISPR, scientists have discovered that it would be ideal to increase fetal hemoglobin levels instead of adult hemoglobin levels, because research has shown that 
in infants as CD symptoms show after fetal hemoglobin levels decrease. So how this would work is that you would harvest a patient's blood stem cells directly from their blood and they would edit the genes to turn on the gene for fetal hemoglobin. Then once chemotherapy has eliminated all the disease causing blood stem cells, the edited stem cells will be fed back into the body with an IV. This method is called ex vivo genome editing. And the goal would be that the gene edited cell, stem cells would take up residence within the bone marrow and produce more edited stem cells that would produce fetal hemoglobin. There have been many remarkable results, including patients have normal to near normal hemoglobin levels, with 30 to 40 percent being fetal hemoglobin. The most remarkable would be that patients no longer need any blood transfusions. And lastly, molecular tests on bone marrow after a year show continued presence of the edited cells. So if results continue to be this positive, a treatment could be approved as soon as 2023. That's it, thank you for watching.